I'm uh, David Escanel. I'm the lead developer at Tractor Supply. Uh, tractor Supply, as you see our little thing right there, if you've ever been into a Tractor Supply, uh, it's uh, a store, a retail organization. Uh, it's a retail outlet where we uh, sell products for the outdoor lifestyle, right? So uh, we're like a lot of other retail organizations. We have a website and we have uh, order processing. We have uh, uh, warehouse uh, logistics and all kinds of fun stuff. So um, there it is. So as I was saying, we have uh, several of the, these other things. We use uh, SAP. Uh, for our customer relations, uh, relationship management. We use uh, SAP for financial systems, uh, but we have to integrate all that stuff together, and that's where we use WSO2. So what we had, what we still have actually, uh, but the, the basic uh, uh, integration uh, platform that we had before was using ActiveMQ as the plumbing underneath, uh, we used uh, the Enterprise Service Bus. Uh, we use version 4.8.1 right now. Uh, uh, we're talking about moving and what do we actually move to. Uh, and we use the Data Services Server, uh, version 3.5.1 on there. So um, the problem that we uh, would run into, we had several problems, but uh, the first of which was that we were unable to track changes. Uh, and release those differences into production. We felt like we were blind all the time. Uh, you would put something out and um, we never knew by looking at production uh, what was actually out there, uh, what the changes were, uh, things like that. Uh, we had another problem that we couldn't reliably produce uh, our artifacts. Sometimes they would be deformed, uh, sometimes they would be whatever, uh, but we couldn't uh, produce the same ones every single time. Uh, so that was a problem. Uh, we couldn't test those changes that we made. Uh, uh, we may be able to test them one time uh, this way, uh, maybe we'll test them another time another way, but we didn't have a standard way to make that happen. Um, also, our testing typically was a matter of just hitting an endpoint. Does it respond? Yes, it does. That's good enough. So we'll go with it from there. So. Um, we kept running into build issues. Uh, as we would build things, uh, we found that uh, we would build it over here and it would collapse over there. Uh, another problem that we had was we would be building on our local desktops and that was enough. Uh, so as long as we built the artifact there, we could deploy that all the way through and, and send it to prod. Um, that produced problems because we would have, uh, uh, we would have um, uh, environment variables passed that were set up on a local machine uh, that didn't actually exist in prod. And uh, another problem there was our local machines were actually Windows computers in, in some cases. Uh, and our production systems were Linux uh, production systems. So uh, paths were different, all sorts of other things. So um, another big problem that we had, uh, several years ago we had a problem with uh, ActiveMQ not being reliable. Um, it was kind of like Goofy in this old jalopy, right? Uh, so uh, we saw that it was going down on a regular basis. Uh, uh, and when I say regular, I mean a couple times a day. Uh, we got to the point where developers would have to babysit the application to make sure that the servers were running. Uh, that's not fun. Um, we were rebuilding the Gaha DB frequently. Uh, when ActiveMQ dies, uh, the Kaha DB, which is uh, the persistent store between the two uh, nodes, the active and, and the passive node. Uh, when ActiveMQ dies, then the KahaDB becomes corrupt. Uh, or when it's moved or, or something strange happens on the server, then it becomes corrupt and we have to actually go in and, and delete things, uh, uh, replay journal files, all that other fun, fun stuff. So uh, that, was, that was very pretty painful. So. Uh, what we found was that there was a bad, I say on here that there was a bad network switch. I don't remember whether it was a network switch or there was something in the storage layer, but we had some problems on the infrastructure side of things. Once those were corrected, uh, then the server came back up and we were fine. We never had a problem again. So, uh, but that sort of put a black eye on our team and, and what we were working on. So, um, Still though, uh, the, the architecture that we were using with ActiveMQ presented a single point of failure. Uh, it, 
we had that, uh, that, that persistent store where KahaDB was sitting, and uh, we needed to try and overcome that. So um, another problem, so uh, as we were uh, building things, uh, we started to look at what the admin services did there. Uh, WSO2 provides this nice uh, REST-based sort of SOAP-based, uh, I've seen both of them, uh, the API layer uh, that we can make a call to and it will say deploy a car file or add properties or whatever. And uh, these admin services are what the entire uh, uh, AP or admin console was built on, right? So it's supposed to be making those calls onto the back, back end there. Um, I looked at that and thought, well, gee, then we ought to be able to build something there. But uh, uh, in writing that, I found that um, they're, they're, the documentation, I would say, is woefully inadequate, but uh, that's probably giving it a lot. Uh, the documentation for that was uh, non-existent. So what I ended up doing there uh, was basically uh, hitting the uh, endpoint with the WSDL, getting back the WSDL, and then making lots of calls to try and feel out what was in there. Uh, my understanding is uh, uh, that uh, a lot of people have done this kind of thing before, uh, so we just need to leverage that. Um, so, uh, so what I ended up doing was fumbling around uh, using the stubs. So they create these stubs that we can use uh, uh, to access those, and they're all located there in uh, Maven repository, mvnrepository.com. So that was helpful. So our solution to a lot of this, um, when we would have a lot of build problems, by using a standard Hudson server, uh, we got to the point where we could build them reliably at the same time every single time. Uh, you would run that script uh, within, the, within the Hudson server, Jenkins being the same thing. Uh, uh, there are other build servers, uh, you know, Bamboo in, in Atlassian and whatnot. We decided we didn't want to pay for it, so we used this one, right? Uh, so, uh, in using that Hudson build server, it would have the uh, uh, same, uh, uh, we could run the same uh, uh, build every single time. Uh, and it was really just a Maven file. Uh, we ended up doing uh, a lot of things through the Maven file. Uh, one of the big things was that we added version numbers. Uh, out of the box, uh, the, the Maven file that, uh, the POM file that comes with it uh, generates a car file named, uh, the car file name underscore one underscore zero dot car, right? Uh, well, that didn't give a lot of information, and that's where our big problem was. Every time we would build, we would use the same uh, version number, right? So by simply adding this, uh, version 1.3.2, et cetera, uh, we would go with a, a, a pretty standard uh, version numbering scheme, and that would allow us to see every single build uh, and all the things that are within the build, so that was very helpful. Uh, here, so I was talking about basically Maven. Uh, uh, within the POM files, uh, we can do lots of different things. Uh, renaming the artifact that gets generated so that it makes, makes sense with the version numbers. Uh, basically, I would use this to take those car files and take any other artifacts that are generated uh, uh, DBS files for the DSS, things like that, and deploy them out to, well not deploy, but send them out to a Maven repository. Uh, we use uh, uh, Nexus. Uh, and so they would simply be stored there and we would be able to access them later. Uh, and we could have all of our uh, previous versions, which was very helpful and very good. So. Um, and then uh, we built a deployment app, um, continuing to build it as most software is, right? It's a continuous, uh, uh, it's continually under development, right? Uh, but that's where I was using the, uh, the uh, uh, admin services to make that happen. Um, I looked at the possibility of using something like uh, Puppet and Chef, but it didn't really give me the on-demand control that I was looking for. Uh, and I'm sure that there are some, some other ways that we can, we can do that and make that work, so. So in the future, going forward, what uh, I expect is that uh, we're going to be looking at 
uh, either replacing or upgrading ActiveMQ. Uh, one of the things that we've done at Tractor Supply is we've uh, uh, made a big investment in uh, using uh, some other products. Uh, and uh, so we have a support contract with Red Hat. Uh, we have uh, some uh, software IG stuff. Uh, so there are a couple of different QA technologies that we can use in there. Uh, and so we just need to decide what is a good replacement for ActiveMQ. Um, uh, right now we're using the standard out of the box H2 databases all the way through. And uh, I noticed that those, have, those become corrupt pretty quickly as well. Uh, so we're moving those to Oracle. That's not a, a big change. Uh, it's a pretty simple change to make. It's just a matter of going through and getting all the testing done. Uh, as you know, little changes, half hour changes actually take about uh, two or three weeks uh, by the time we add in testing and deployment and code review and all the other fun stuff that we have to do. So. And I expect to continue to add functionality to this deployment tool or however we end up doing deployments uh, going forward in the future. So uh, adding functionality, I see things like, uh, uh, I mean, it already deploys the car files and it will uh, deploy properties as we need to. Uh, which has been really helpful with um, uh, any time the H2 database has become corrupt, then um, I simply use a backup of the properties and I can quickly deploy all the properties. Um, prior to that, I would say, I don't know, three months ago, uh, I would probably spend four hours going through all of the properties. We had several hundred and then copying them over and, and adding them back in one by one. And it's very error prone. Uh, it was not a good situation, so. Uh, but those are the things that it does right now. I see in the future uh, uh, being able to manage the uh, multiple instances that we have, uh, being able to uh, do some things that uh, it doesn't currently do. So that's my email address. And I just wanted to say thank you all for having us here. Um, uh, this has been a, actually a fantastic thing. I noticed that uh, most of the uh, uh, talks that we go to, uh, we talk a lot about what, what the new thing is. Uh, these sort of customer stories are very helpful to find out what people are actually doing with the product. So, uh, and I don't know if they're going to make these slides available. Uh, I've put them on at this address just in case. So um, I wanna open it up at this point if y'all have any questions. I'd uh, love to make it more of a question answer kind of thing, so. Sorry, so does, does it mix um, um, automation with the Jenkins, Hudson uh, uh, scripts and admin services, or is it just straight to the WC2 components? It's a, it's a straight, actually, so um, initially it's just a Java application mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it's kind of a command line driven application, uh, allowing it to make the calls on the back end. Uh, it also has a web component, so there's a front end component as well. Uh, uh, we're using uh, AngularJS and some other things to make that work. Um, but uh, the intention is not for it to be a scripted type thing, mm -hmm. uh, like you would do coming from a Jenkins or something like that. Uh, but uh, we haven't, haven't gotten that far with it, so. Okay, thanks. Are these initiatives for standardization uh, like an initiative inside Tractor Supply or is this specific to your team that you're working on? Uh, so this is specific to the, to the team. Um, I would uh, like to try and uh, make it more of a uh, thing that the rest of the company actually does, uh, working with code reviews, working with uh, things like that to kind of make the process work better. Um, uh, we don't really have that, uh, we haven't gotten that far with it. So. How did you solve the issue about uh, different configurations for different environments as you move to a production? Is that in the deployment part of the deployment app, or where where do you manage that? Different configurations in production. Like different paths, building on your local machine versus. 
so the, the problem that we had with uh, building on a local machine uh, and then deploying those, we solved by running through a single build server, a Hudson that we're using, right? Uh, so what that did was it, it built it in the same way. The pass that we were generating, we would know exactly what we were building when we would build it and send it out. Um, now we had, what do we have, three? Four different uh, profiles, if you will, uh, of servers that we uh, send out to. We have uh, groups of servers within there. Uh, so we may have uh, four servers in this group and whatever. So um, we initially had a problem where we would have to deploy uh, to these groups of servers and they would have different configurations. And uh, that's, what, that's one of the things that the deployment tool helps us do. Uh, using something like Puppet or Chef, Chef would help us with that as well, Ansible, whatever, uh, that would give us the ability to kind of create those multiple profiles and say, just deploy this thing to these places. But having uh, that control over it, that, that fine-grained control where I could get in and say, look, specifically for me, I have these groups, uh, that's where we ended up writing, writing some of the stuff ourselves. Any others? All right. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>